Hello and welcome to the course Microservices Architecture. My name is Dimas Raptis and I will be your instructor for this course, where we will be talking about the microservices architecture. This topic has become very important during the last years, as we will see during the course. So I'm really excited I have the opportunity to teach this course and I believe it will be very useful to you. Let me introduce myself first. As I mentioned previously, my name is Demos and I'm a software engineer having worked in different environments ranging from small software shops to big tech companies. I have experience in different programming languages, but my main expertise lies in Java and the JVM ecosystem. I've been working in a microservices environment for the last four years, also having experience from more monolithical systems. So I've seen the pros and cons of both approaches. You can find some more information about me in my personal website, or you can follow me on Twitter. Let's have an overview of the course, outlining the main structure and what we will be studying on each section. This course consists of seven sections. In the first section, we will introduce the term of a microservices architecture and look at the evolution from previous architecture, explaining what were some of the factors that contributed to the success of the microservices movement. We'll also study the Conway's law and its relation to the microservices architecture. We'll define the terms of coupling and cohesion, which are crucial for building software that is maintainable. We'll refer to these terms in the rest of the course when explaining why we make certain decisions. We'll also introduce the concept of domain-driven design and explain how it can help us build better software. In the second section, we will introduce our sample problem, which we will be tackling during the course. We'll sketch a high-level design and start building our first microservice. We'll also introduce the terms of continuous integration and continuous deployment and we will demonstrate how we can implement them for our microservice. In the third section, we'll focus on the topic of integration between multiple systems and services. We'll outline the various integration techniques we can use in order to make systems work with each other and the pros and cons of each one. We'll then start building our second microservice using one of these techniques. We'll also talk about the topics of monitoring and logging, which are crucial when we start having multiple services. We'll give some best practices and demonstrate how we can practically implement monitoring for our second service. In the fourth section, we will discuss what are the various approaches we can use to scale our systems and the characteristics of each one. We'll also demonstrate how we could scale our second microservice, if needed. We'll explain the concept of service discovery, why it's very important microservices architecture, and how we can implement it. We'll conclude the section by introducing the patterns of the service mess and the API gateway, comparing the benefits of each one. In the fifth section, we will look at the concept of serverless architecture explaining its main characteristics and how it works under the hood. We'll discuss the pros and cons of this model and what are the use cases where it can be beneficial. We'll also demonstrate how we can migrate our second microservice to a serverless application. In the sixth section, we'll focus on providing best practices and general tips, which can be useful when moving to a microservices architecture. More specifically, we will look at how we can approach the design of a microservices architecture and what are some things we should pay attention to. We'll explain what polyglot persistence means and how we can leverage it in our microservices architecture by choosing the right technologies for each job. We'll also show some basic steps that can help you migrate your monolith to a microservices architecture. In the seventh and last section, we we'll look at some industry examples of companies that adopted the microservices architecture in a successful way. We will look at the reasons that led them to this decision, concrete examples of how they changed their architecture, 
and lessons they learn during this journey. The first example we will look at is Netflix, a company that started as a DVD rental service and evolved into an online streaming service. The second example we will look at is Gilt, an online shopping startup that focused on flash sales. This course will consist of two components, a theoretical part where we will be introducing and explaining technical terms, and a practical part where we will actually be using these terms, building real-life systems. As we mentioned previously, for the practical part, we will provide a toy problem in the second section and we will be building the solution to this problem as the course progresses. In the first practical part, we'll provide you with a template project. You can use this to start developing on your own, and it's the same one that we will be using to develop the solutions to each problem. Our approach will be the following. During the theoretical part, we'll be explaining the problem and outlining the main structure of our solution and the tools we will use. That way, you can experiment on your own if you want to. After that, we'll be demonstrating our solution to the problem, explaining its main parts, also showing how you can reproduce it and run it on your own environment. Of course, every practical part will contain the code for our solution so that you can study it more thoroughly on your own. We've done our best to make the content of this course accessible to everyone by providing simple explanations of basic concepts and providing simple instructions in our solutions so that you can reproduce everything without requiring advanced technical knowledge. However, the topic of the course is highly technical, so there are some basic prerequisites. We'll be mainly using Java as our programming language for the systems we will be building, so you should have some experience writing software or at least be familiar with this or any other object-oriented programming language. Except Java, we'll also use Python for some very small parts. We'll also be using Linux as our operating system and we will be using the command line for most of our tasks. So being familiar with the command line will help you get started with the course more easily. Of course, our microservices architecture will be built on top of the basic internet technologies such as DNS, IP, and HTTP. So being familiar with what these technologies are and what purpose they serve will help you understand better our practical parts. Last but not least, the most important prerequisite for getting the most out of this course is a curiosity to learn. The microservices architecture is a huge topic with many different aspects which makes it really hard to cover everything in a single course. However, for topics that we won't be able to cover in full detail, we'll provide references of resources you can use to learn more on your own. In order to be able to follow our practical parts and have the best experience, I'd recommend that you do the following. You will need to have a laptop with a memory of 4 gigabytes and a disk of 20 gigabytes minimum. A less powerful machine might still be adequate, but running our examples might be a bit slower. We'll use an Ubuntu Linux operating system for our examples, so it would be ideal if you have the same one. However, other operating systems can work fine as long as you've installed the tools in the right way for your operating system. You must have Java and the Maven tool installed in your machine, with Java being version 7 or later. You'll also need to install Python, since we will be using it in just a few parts. The code editor we'll, we'll be using is IntelliJ, which you can download for free from the following link. We'll also make use of the Postman plugin for making requests to the services we will be built. Lastly, we'll be deploying our systems in the cloud and we will be using AWS for this purpose. So make sure you've created an AWS account and downloaded the AWS CLI. Every AWS account comes with a free tier, which means that you can use several of the services for free for a specific period of time. We've made sure that all the services we'll be using 
fall under the free tier. So as long as you delete the resources in the end of each section, you should be able to complete the course at no additional cost. Now that we've given an introduction to what this course will be about and covered all the logistics involved, I think we are ready to get started with the first section.